friends, thank you for joining us for another one of our seven educational sessions for all sectors of the floriculture industry. Whether you're a traditional florist, a mass marketer, or e-commerce, or whether you're part of a consumer-facing operations or the back-end supply chain, we have something today just for you. Today's educator is the product manager for Floralife, a division of Smithers Oasis Company. He's an honors graduate of Northumbria University's Business and Economics program and a graduate of the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. He leads the global sustainability initiatives for Floralife and has held significant roles in the product category ranging from planning all the way to manufacturing. Today, we have a special treat. He's going to share his wisdom with us on sustainability initiatives in the global floriculture industry and how we apply them to our everyday business. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Mark Allen. All right, thank you, Cindy, appreciate that. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, as Cindy mentioned, I'm Mark Allen and I'm the Global Product Manager of Floraline. Uh, what that means is I, I look after the development process of new products, going through the stage gear, getting them ready for launch. Then I also manage, manage the, the products that we have out there in the market and make sure they still tick the boxes uh, for the consumers and they get all the, the best quality out of them. So if you don't know, uh, Floralife is a company that's been around for 80 plus years now. And we were actually the inventor of the flower food packet. Um, and that flower food packet, everyone's seen it. It comes with a lot of all the flowers in the industry. And it's there to really enhance the consumer's experience with their flowers by increasing that quality and base life of those flowers. But also over the years, we've developed many other products and protocols, processes um, that are used throughout the farm all the way through to the supply chain to that end consumer to enhance the quality, to reduce the, you know, the death of the stems and everything else that could happen as the flower journeys from the farm all the way to the consumer's table. But more recently, the topic of sustainability has come up uh, really more and more often, I'm sure you can all agree. And, you know, a few years ago, we found ourselves in a position where, you know, we questioned really the sustainable choices we were making. And if we actually truly understood what it was we were trying to achieve, you know, this led to an extensive rethink and a refocus on sustainability, which I now leave for floor life, as Cindy mentioned. And through this presentation, I'm going to try and take you on our journey, some of our understanding, some of the education we received, uh, to really start understanding, you know, and start shaping how we want to approach this going forward. So from this point on, um, I'll briefly share a little bit more about what catalyzed or accelerated our refocus, and then go straight into really what is sustainability, the big picture, you know, meaning what challenges of the planet are we facing and why should we act? You know, and followed by a more focused look on the floral industry, you know, why it can be good for your business, and then finish on how, you know, can, how can you start? You know, if you're not doing something already, how can you start focusing on these sustainable projects and really drive them in the correct way? Okay, so, so who am I and, you know, how did I end up getting the pleasure of being here and talking to you all about sustainability? Uh, you know, th those are some really interesting questions. To be I, mean, I never expected myself to be here doing this. But as, as I mentioned, that, you know, I manage the development of new products. And what we found over the past few years is a drastic increase in the need to solve sustainability related challenges, you know, whilst also continuing to provide the same quality and value of product. And this led to so many different projects over the years, like reducing the plastic uh, that we use or reviewing our formulas, carbon footprint assessing of products. And I mean, the list goes on, we've done a lot of things. The problem was we were going from project to project without really understanding the core reason for why we were doing what we were doing. Uh, for example, recently we had a sustainable film project uh, in 2018. So that's all about replacing the current flower food packaging, the plastic we use, or something that's more sustainable. I use my fingers there because really the whole thing opened my eyes to the subject. So as we progressed this project, the sustainable film in 2018, we found ourselves with actually far more questions than answers the further we got into it. And kind of at that point, we stopped and we decided to go back to school because we found that we could just go into so many different directions with sustainable film. You know, you've got things like biodegradable, compostable, recyclable. What's the difference between them all? Paper, plastic, all these different questions. And the funny thing is when you talk with your suppliers, uh, you know, they're all selling different advantages and they're all saying every single one's green. So it's very difficult to know which one to go to. 
So launching something at that moment kind of felt irresponsible and instead we decided to go back to school and, and really learn more about it. Because, you know, we didn't want to launch something that if someone asked us the question, we couldn't answer. You know, it's, it, it felt irresponsible. But on top of that, you know, it's also quite risky for the business because you could spend all this time and money and effort on developing something that doesn't actually tick the end boxes or maybe the legislation changes in six months or whatever. And then all you do is you find yourself going backwards against this development curve and it's highly inefficient and costs a lot of money. So last year, multiple members of the Smithers Oasis organization or the Smithers Oasis uh, company um, achieved a qualification in business sustainability management from the University of Cambridge and the Institute of Sustainability Leadership. And, you know, I, I'm by no means sponsored by this course in any way, but I really can say it was a great foundation for an understanding of what sustainability is truly about and starts to make you ask all these questions about how you can bring this sort of thought into your business. Uh, so I really do recommend this course to anyone that, that could be interested. Okay, so that's enough about floral life and, and all of that. And let's really get back into what is sustainability. That's what we're here for. So what is sustainability? That, that big question. And when putting together this presentation, I, I spent 60 seconds or so writing down everything that popped into my mind. And, you know, I could have, the list goes on, you know, I could probably fill another seven screens. Um, but I think what this really illustrates when you, when you look at all of this is just the issues that a business faces when trying to adopt sustainable practices, because there's just so much wide varying stuff involved that it's almost impossible to catch up on and it's ever changing. And quite honestly, you know, sustainability is really about pretty much everything, if not everything. So this in itself makes it a very daunting thing to start trying to do this, start trying to bring it into your business. But I hope as we go through this presentation, you'll see how it's more about being a journey and you really don't need to have all the answers to begin with. I mean, all of these things you see on the screen, they definitely are relevant and important, but you have time to digest, you know, ask the right questions and come to the conclusions about if it should be incorporated, if certain, these certain things could be incorporated into your business plan. Okay. So cutting through everything, the base definition of what is sustainability is the following. It's the ability to sustain or improve the current standard of living without jeopardizing the standard of living of future generations. And I mean, that sounds relatively simple, right? It's as long as we live and do good by our planet and our societies, then we should be okay. The, the problem is a lot of sustainability related problems, whether that be environmental or social are really directly related to one word and that, that word is consumption what we consume, how we consume it, why are we consuming it, and ultimately, is it actually really necessary to consume it? And the thing is, there's just so many different factors that drive this word, this consumption. And on top of that, you know, you find so many contradicting things as well. Uh, let me give you an example. So as markets, economies, or um, countries, as they develop and prosper, you know, there's more money going around, that really fuels consumption, that people just have more money to buy products and other services and do things. You know, which and all of these products and services and whatever have their unique way of impacting the planet in some way or, or society. So the more money flowing around an economy can also lead to higher investment in education and healthcare, you know, an overall better quality of life. That sounds great. But keep in mind, and, and keep in mind, sustainability from a sustainability standpoint, uh, it's not only important to look at environmental issues like climate change, pollution, and so on but also social aspects like equality, freedom of speech, access to water and all of those other basic needs. So this investment that I mentioned in education and healthcare can lead to a reduction in death rates. Great. And, you know, it can increase birth rates. Great again, you know, but overall that leads to an increased population. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you have to think the higher the population, it's just another reason that consumption is going to continue to rise. And we're going to con continue to deplete and use all of these resources the planet gives us. So you kind of see at this point that there's this exponentially increasing cycle of market development and it ultimately fuels the consumption of everything and really puts a strain on the world resources. It encourages widening and equality gaps and, and all these other things. So it really is a true problem for the planet and every year it just gets that little bit worse as certain, you know, um, you know, as, as certain markets develop and prosper and, and all of that, this consumption continues to rise just a little bit every, every year. You know, so it's estimated at this moment that we actually consume our planet's oil supplies or our fossil fuels 50% more than actually what's put back every year or what's generated every year. So at some point, you know, if we continue what we're doing, we are going to run out. And 
the big question is what is the planet going to do if that happens? Do we have the technology ready and in place to be able to take care of that? And there's all these big questions. And the thing is, I haven't even mentioned at this point, you know, what's the impact to the planet, to the environment, consuming these fossil fuels and other things like that at that rate. So all of these issues lead on to the question, you know, what can we do about it as an individual? What can we do about it as a business, as an industry? And, you know, really help minimize our impact to really ensure a good standard of living for ourselves, uh, for our neighbors and for future generations. So I should say at this point, you'll notice in the, the top right corner of the screen, um, the words, some words or phrases. These are for you to note down and maybe Google or, or look up after the presentation. They add extra depth to what I'm talking about. So for instance, the great acceleration, you know, there's so many graphs and things and it really shows just how quick over the past 50 years we've accelerated uh, our consumption of all these different things. So uh, yeah, so make sure to watch those as we go through the slides and take note of them because you can get some extra information uh, after. Okay, so I mentioned at the start this big picture, you know, what are our sustainable efforts contributing towards, you know, what are we trying to achieve and why? And I would say this is one of the things that was missing for Floralife. We were doing all these great projects, but we didn't quite understand what it was we were overall contributing towards in doing those projects. I hope that makes sense. So to be able to illustrate this, I kind of want to go from the biggest picture possible and then start filtering that down or funneling that down to a more focused approach the further on the presentation we get. So we start with the history of the planet, we then talk about the focus picture in the business and then how can we implement inside the business. So hopefully that, that's apparent when we get through the slides. And you know, I thought what bigger way or what bigger picture can we look at than really just the history of the planet? So about 4.5 billion years ago, the earth was formed and, and life began. In geology, the timeline for the planet is split into sections. So the largest is an eon, which is split into so many eras, which is then split into so many periods. Uh, which is then split into so many epochs and you know then the epoch and the epoch is kind of the important one that I'm going to talk about here but then these epochs can then be split into ages so earlier on or later on in that epoch but the long story short here is there's just been so many of these things called epochs over the past 4.5 billion years and basically to define an epoch it's it's pretty much a period of time that's categorized by the condition of the planet in that time and, you know, it can be tracked by things like disturbances and rock formations and all of that, you know, geology and, and everything. And the interesting part is these epochs start and end with something called a golden spike. It's an event or a situation which causes a dramatic shift on the planet. You know, it could be that the Earth's crust move or the significant changes to climate um, and so on. I'm, and the, I mean, there's other things that could cause it. And what that does is it significantly alters life on the planet at that moment. And it can cause new life to thrive and, you know, unfortunately, unadaptable life to just disappear or go extinct. So if we zoom in on the most recent epochs, which is kind of crazy that the most recent ones are starting 5.3 million years ago, which is when the Pliocene began. Then there was a significant change to climate 2.6 million years ago and the Pleistocene began. The Pleistocene is also referred to as the, um, the most recent ice age. And this is when ice covered large proportions of the planet and life was significantly changed. There was that golden spike. Then roughly 11,700 years ago, the ice melted, the climate shifted once again, and another significant change to life happened. We entered something called the Holocene. Now, technically the Holocene is our current epoch. You know, it makes a lot of sense, especially when you look at the timeline. You know, I, I mean, this diagram is definitely not the scale, but you've got something that lasted 2.7 million years, then 2.6 million years. I think I did the math there wrong. Anyway, no, maybe I didn't. 2.7 million years, 2.6 million years, and now only a fraction to the current one. But what's interesting about this whole thing is there's hot debate right now whether the planet's already shifted into a new epoch, which is being called the Anthropocene. On my screen, sorry, the, the camera's covering it, but I, I think you can see it. And it's been called the Anthropocene. The idea is that over the past 400 years, human activity, for instance, um, in the early 1600s, when the now United States was colonized, or the 1700s, when the Industrial Revolution kicked off, or the great acceleration I mentioned and the exponentially increasing use of all these world resources and stuff, globalization and all these other things that's happened in the past 400 years are starting to have these significant changes on the planet. And the big question that needs to be answered and there's a lot of hot debate is have we actually created a golden spike in the past 400 years just from our activity alone? And that, that kind of blows my mind considering you look at the state of how long these things typically last in the history of the planet. Mm. So what does all this mean for the planet? Sorry, one second. 
back in 2009, some very smart people got together at the Stockholm Resilience Center in Sweden. And what they did was they defined these things called the planetary boundaries. These are nine different things, which uh, things we monitor to understand the bigger picture of where our planet sits environmentally. It's all based on being in this safe zone, that green zone you see in the middle. And then, um, you know, it's, it's, so it's based on risk. And the further you go out, you go into this yellow zone, you go into this red zone. And as I mentioned, the further out you go, the higher the risk. Now, what this risk refers to is the chances that a devastating irreversible change will occur. So the further in the red you are, the more, you know, the more risk we've got of some of these terrible things happening. So an example could be if global temperatures continue to rise, then the ice caps can melt, forcing irreversible changes to balance of the planet. You know, ecosystems are disrupted, certain life can die off. So they have these nine boundaries. And I mean, because of time, I'm not really gonna go into too much detail, but I will try and give a brief overview of each one and maybe an example. Okay, so the first we'll look at is climate change. And this is probably, and you can see this at the top, this is probably the most known of all the boundaries. And what this refers to is the gradual increasing temperature of the planet. And as the planet changes temperature, systems on the planet can be disrupted or modified. You know, this is measured by looking at concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You know, they're trying to keep these carbon dioxide concentrations at around 350 ppm or parts per million. And at the moment, we are actually already at 400 ppm and it's ever increasing. So we're beyond the where we want to be for this safe zone. Um, and, you know, what really drives this is the consumption of fossil fuels. It really impacts this figure because as we burn oil in the processes that we've developed over time, like, um, like a combustion engine or in a car, it releases this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the problem is having all this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is causing the sun's energy to be trapped inside of our atmosphere, causing the heating up of the planet. And that's basically climate change. So the next one we have is biosphere integrity. And sorry, I'm kind of going anti-clockwise, which feels wrong, but it's the way my notes are. Um, you can also call biosphere integrity uh, biodiversity or biodiversity loss. And that's basically a fancy way of saying how diverse is the life on the planet. It's all to do with uh, the dying or extinction of living species. And, you know, it could be the extinct, extinction of plants as well as animals or, or humans or whatever. So the goal here is to actually keep within 90% and we've already exceeded this. So of all the species we know about uh, over time that we, we know about in, on our planet, actually we've lost more than 10% of them due to our footprint on the planet. So we, we really need to do something about that. Um, the next one is land system change. Uh, this is all about the conversion of forests and wetlands into agricultural land. You know, when we, when we do this, when we convert and we deforest, we actually disrupt the cycling of carbon dioxide. Less trees mean more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Additionally, you know, there's strong links to biodiversity loss because we're cutting down habitats when we deforest and other things. So the goal here is to maintain 75% of the world's forests, and we're actually already down to 62%. So again, another one we need to look at. Um, okay, the next one is fresh water usage. Uh, so the earth is really thought of as a water planet. I mean, we have water everywhere. If you look at a picture of the globe, you will mainly see blue water. The issue is only 3% of this water is actually fresh water. And the majority of it's actually locked in the ice caps. So of that 3% that's fresh water that's usable, it's, you know, I think 60% or so is actually locked into the ice caps. And fresh water is really required for a lot of processes, man-made processes and whatever else. But most importantly, it's required for life to thrive. You know, animals, plants, ourselves, we, we drink this. And, you know, some areas of the world have far less, far less access to water than others. And we really need to make sure from a social perspective that everyone has access to this basic need. You know, we can't just waste it on, on certain things. Okay, so the next one is biogeochemical flows. And it's all to do with the amount of nitrogen or phosphorus that we're putting into the environment. And it is primarily driven by agriculture. You know, the fertilizers we use, we have, they have these types of um, components to them. So not only do these things contribute to climate change, but they also contribute to biodiversity loss in the seas and in the oceans, because as these chemicals and runoffs end up in the rivers, they end up disrupting the ecosystems as part of that system. So roughly, right now, we're actually consuming double the target amount of nitrogen and phosphorus than actually what we should be to be staying inside of that safe zone. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on we need to think about. Okay, the next one is ocean acidification. Something like a quarter of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is eventually absorbed by the oceans. This forms something called, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, carbonic acid, uh, I think that's right. 
And what that does is it decreases the surface pH level of water. So the, the, surf, the pH is the potential of hydrogen. It's about how acidic or alkaline or, or neutral a, a solution is. And it, it decreases that pH of the water. It, it moves that environment, that water, towards a more acidic environment. And what that's doing is it's dissolving key minerals needed by things like corals and shellfish in order to survive. You know, so for instance, shellfish no longer have the building blocks. I think it's like argonite or something. Uh, in order to create their shells, and you know that that causes issues for the for their life. Now, I mean, we're still well within the the goal and continue to do so, providing we stay within the safe zone for climate change. So you can see there's there's a strong link between ocean acidification and climate change because that's all to do with the balancing of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. More in the atmosphere, more gets absorbed by the oceans. You can kind of see the pattern there. Okay, so the next one is atmospheric aerosol loading. You know, it's all to do with the emissions of microparticles. Funny enough, typically some things that are found in aerosols. And um, they haven't actually defined what this boundary looks like yet. Um, you know, where's the safe zone? But the issue with these microparticle pollutions is that it can get in the way of, you know, really key planetary processes like cloud formations. It can affect monsoon systems and so on. You know, the more we change things like this, the more ecosystems that rely on them are actually disrupted. Uh, you know, actually all the more disasters that we could end up creating for other people. So this is something that is typically regional, you know, from a planet perspective, we're actually well within this boundary. Um, but, you know, in some areas like South Asia, their monsoon season is actually disrupted due to heightened levels of uh, aerosol optical depth. That's the fancy way of measuring how much microparticles they are. So again, it's another thing we need to watch out for and, and work together on. Okay, the next, the second last one is stratospheric ozone depletion. And this is all to do with something called our ozone layer. It's this layer in the, in the atmosphere. And what that does is it significantly reduces the amount of sun's ultraviolet or UV radiation that enters the planet. You know, we all use sunscreen, right? And I mean, think about it, if we didn't have this thing protecting us, how much sunscreen we really would need. And it's the same for plants, you know, ultraviolet radiation can really get in and be harmful, affecting DNA and whatever. So this increased consumption of these ozone depleting chemicals actually reduces that protective layer and can cause significant harm to life on the planet. And actually, if you look back to the 1980s, we were actually significantly worse on this. I mean, we were like well into the red zone, but uh, thanks to the Montreal Protocol, which is an international treaty put in place, it was actually designed to phase out these harmful chemicals. And we actually are on track to stopping the destruction of the ozone layer because of this. So there's some great things to read on that. Okay, then the final one is novel entities. And this is all to do with the dumping of man-made chemicals or substances into our environment. Um, this boundary is, you know, out of all of them, probably the most man-made one of, of everything. We pretty much invented this whole thing because it's all, you know, it's not quantified yet, but it's all to do with things like microplastics and radioactive materials. And, and you know, we need to understand how putting these into our, or dumping these into different environments like landfills and the oceans, rivers, wherever they go, you know, what is it doing to the life on the planet? So that's all of the boundaries. I'm sorry, it was a lot of information. Um, but one thing to really know is, and I think you, I touched on this a little bit, is they're not independent of each other. You know, they aren't just these individual things standing alone. And you can find a lot of relationships between all of them, you know? So where, what I mean by that is where one change of something can actually have a direct or indirect impact on another boundary. So I'll give you an example, I touched on this earlier. If we consume more of the fossil fuels, uh, you know, our carbon emissions are gonna to continue to go up. The higher carbon emissions means worsening climate change. The heightened level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere means more ocean acidification goes on, which then leads to increased biodiversity loss due to the, the fact that the ecosystems, you know, in the waters, they're being disrupted by that acidic environment. So right there, I've touched on climate change, ocean acidification and biodiversity loss in, in one go. And as you learn more about these planetary boundaries, you know, and all these tipping elements and everything else that's there, you can really start to see a lot of relationships and how they all work together. But additionally, you know, from a sustainability perspective, you can also find examples of how, or how we go about achieving these boundaries can also have a negative impact on sustainability. And that, that might sound a little crazy, but let me give you an example. If we reduce our deforestation and, then, and you know, so that improves that land system change boundary, then we actually could hypothetically run out of farming space, assuming we're utilizing all of our farming space correctly. And, you know, that means, no, so if we run out of space, then we can't maybe maintain the food supply. And, you know, the issue there is we've got population increasing and then people can't be fed properly. So you have to remember that sustainability is not just about the environment impact, but it's also about societal impacts too. 
and it's about the people's you know right to an equal quality of life so this is why the term balance is just so important you know and it's what makes this actually so hard you know you can't approach a sustainable choice from one angle or you might end up missing that bigger picture and you could end up moving the world in the wrong direction because you're missing some of the extra information you need so balance and education on all of this is just so important to keep us all on the right track and actually overall moving in the right direction and it's what makes it so hard for governments and key policy decision makers to do the right thing because they're balancing something that has so many different things related to it. And then on top of that, you know, consumers perception because of all this surface level education and marketing that goes on, the perception of what's sustainable and maybe what is truly sustainable could actually be very different. And I think that's a very key thing to try and understand. Okay, so we've discussed the planetary boundaries and you know what the issue the, the issue that the planet faces with all the from an environmental perspective. But how do we maintain those boundaries and stay inside the safe zone? You know, additionally, how do we balance the achieving of those boundaries with societal improvements, you know, better healthcare education? So this is where the MDGs or the Millennium Development Goals and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, come in. So back in the early 2000s, the eight Millennium Development Goals were launched. These goals were there to try and measure, track, um, achieve improvements uh, that keep everything balanced. And, you know, as things progress, focus on sustainability definitely intensified. And it was obvious we needed a new approach. So in 2012, the Sustainable Development Goals were formed. And these were 17 goals or um, 17 focus areas that when launched had about, I think, around 169 different specific targets to achieve inside of each of these 17 goals to allow us to move the planet in a sustainable direction to keep us on track for everything we need to do and that's both environmentally and socially so you can see we've got things here about consumption of things we've got goals related to health and well-being and education and climate action and hunger and so on you know so I I'm not going to go into all of these goals, um, but I do recommend you, you doing a bit of research, desk research, Googling, you know, digesting what they're all about, because they really can play a big part in adopting a sustainable business approach. So the big question, at least in my mind, when I was putting this presentation together is if we achieve these sustainable development goals, will we actually stay, uh, will, will the planet actually stay within those planetary boundaries we talked about? Uh, you know, will we stay inside those safe zones? So again, at the, the Stockholm Resilience Center, Resilience Center, some very smart people got together to try and figure actually out the answer to that very question. And, what, and I think it's probably the same people who developed the planetary boundaries. And you know what they ended up doing was developing this thing called the Earth 3 model. So first, I actually wasn't going to include this in the presentation because it can be very heavy to digest. Um, but I think it has a very powerful message, so I'm going to do my best to keep it light. And what that message really comes down to is it's not necessarily about achieving the goals, but it's more about how do we achieve those goals. So the Earth 3 model takes into account a lot of different things like uh, information, history, projections, you know, from loads of different socioeconomic measurements and really predicts where will we be by 2050 based on changing an assumption, you know, changing a, a condition of how we approach these sustainable development goals and, and our markets and all of that. So this, end, so this ended up mapping out four different approaches or four different changes of assumptions. Uh, so the first one, uh, moving forward the same as we always have been. Uh, so nothing really changes, we just continue with what we're doing. The ne and, and the next one is moving forward with a faster approach. The next one is moving forward with a harder approach um, or more focused, I think you could say, approach. And then and the final one is moving forward with a smarter approach. Again, this model is about the bigger picture. So it's, not, it's more about government and policy maker decisions across a collective of all different industries. It's not necessarily about your individual business choices, but I think it's, it's, it's good to understand the baseline message here on a macro scale. So if you look at the graph, the performance of a certain approach is mapped against on average, how many of the sustainable development goals are achieved. And then on average, how many of the planetary boundaries are in the safe zone. So obviously if you look on this left-hand side, and nine, ba um, nine boundaries in the safe zone is good. And then on this bottom part, uh, 17 of the sustainable development goals achieved is good. So I'm not quite sure why it goes to 14. I guess it just makes the graph look better, but I'm sure there's a great reason. Anyway, so the first approach, the same approach, this red line you see, uh, it's pretty obvious. It's about just continuing with what we're doing, our current trajectory, no real change. And for the science people, I guess you could consider this the control. It's what we're benchmarking these changes of assumptions against. 
Now, the issue with this approach is increasing consumption of resources continues, waste and pollution continue, and inequality gaps continue to widen. And you know, what you can also see is it's not necessarily inclusive of the poorer countries. So what this means is that developed nations continually continue to exponentially improve and consume while the poorer countries actually struggle to catch up and the gap widens. And you know, what we need to do is really help accelerate or catalyze their change and really support them. So the next approach is the faster approach. And if you look on the chart, you know, you see here it's this uh, orange line. It doesn't seem to be that much better, but you know, let's look at it anyway. So the assumption put in place here on the faster approach is that on average, the GDP per capita or per person uh, is 1% higher than the historical trend. GDP stands for gross domestic product and it's about the value of products and services inside an economy. And then per person or capita just means per person. So it divides by the number or the population in that economy. So basically the more consumption that happens, the more investment that happens and overall the quicker the countries develop. So, you know, there's just more money going around and you know the markets are developing quicker oops right on back yeah so oh, we had to get to okay the problem here though is it encourages a widening inequality gap because you have to remember in, you know one percent gdp per person doesn't necessarily mean it's shared out equally it's all this on average stuff so others ramp up far quicker while you know others are left behind and doing things Faster also puts a larger strain on those finite world resources we keep talking about. So overall, the faster model, it isn't really good. You know, it doesn't really get us where we need to be. It kind of just accelerates negativity. Okay, so the okay, the next approach is the harder approach. Or you could think of this as a more focused approach. It's an increased focus by governments and decision makers on achieving the sustainable development goals. So the assumption here is that there is a 30% more rapid achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And with this approach, things seem to be better. And you know, you can see here, it's this yellow line. And, you know, we're achieving more of the goals, but we aren't necessarily getting back into that safe zone on the planetary boundaries like we want to. And the issue here is the model predicts a lot of focus goes towards inequality in society. And it actually struggles to balance that against the increasing consumption of everything. And therefore the planetary boundaries end up, you know, I would maybe taking the hit, they don't actually move much. So finally, we have the smarter approach. This is the green line. It definitely looks the best out of all of them. And you know, what I really say here, what I really say here is the key word is smarter, you know, from everything we talked about in this model. It's, it's thinking, what does smarter really mean? So in this model, the government focuses more on transformational policies. You know, it's a focus on renewable energy, sustainable food chains, um, updated development models for poorer nations. Um, you know, how can, how can they grow, but do it in a green way? You know, you really have to consider that it's actually a very hard challenge to do that. You know, we didn't do that. The, the US and Europe and other developed markets, they, they had a really dirty growth model. You know, we consumed like crazy and now we actually expect other countries to do it differently. So we have to support them. How can we expect them to leapfrog fossil fuels without supporting them? You know, so we, we need to help them. So there'll also be a focus on active inequality reduction and finally policies or focus on education, you know, on healthcare and so on. Now this sounds quite straightforward, you know, but the problem countries face is the performance of a country. The reason why countries tend to, you know, exist and continue, I, I guess in a way, is to drive the value of that country's market up. You know, the performance of a country has always predominantly been measured in its value, in its GDP value. You always see how, you know, we compare on nation by nation by GDP, that, that value of goods and services that we talked about before. But the problem is to be successful in the smarter model, we actually need to start shifting some focus away from GDP measuring and then more towards sustainable measuring. How's everyone doing on the sustainable development goals? And I think doing that you know, on a, on a, on a planetary scale is gonna be a very big feat. So that's kind of the end of the big picture. I, I'm sorry, there's a lot of information there. You know, We have our boundaries, we have our sustainable development goals, and we have an overall understanding that to be able to achieve them both, we need to be smarter about what we do and, and why we're doing it. So now we're kind of getting onto the more focused picture, uh, meaning sustainability, not on this sort of large macro level scale, but more micro, more specific to our industry, specific to our business. I, Floral Culture Sustainability Initiative, there's the Rainforest Alliance, there's the adoption of the Global Gap Program, and I mean, there's so many other things. So there's definitely a lot of good stuff going on already. But one thing I did want to bring some attention to is that big word you see on the bottom, waste. 
one challenge of our industry is is basically how how it's set up you know we we can be fairly segmented you know so example we we look at the improvements at the farm we look at the improvements at the importing level we look at the improvements at wholesale or at bouquet operation or at supermarket or at florist but we never combine that all together as a full picture and at the end of the day you know our industry is here to give those users those receiver of flowers the best experience possible but in order to do that we inevitably generate just a lot of waste inside the industry especially considering cut flowers are perishable and they don't last forever you know we really have to get the best out of them so let's say we harvest a billion stems and, and i know there's far more than a billion stems that get harvested every year but let's say we harvest a billion stems and these stems take up land space they get hydrated they get hydrated again they probably get hydrated again and maybe even again uh, you know, they're shipped multiple times, they're packaged multiple times. And if you think about it, if at any point in the chain that one of those stem dies, you know, which really does happen, then that's a significant loss to everything that really went into the production or sale of that stem. It's not just about that flower, it's about everything that's been involved in it. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the segmentation of our industry, you know, means that we tend to look at scrap or shrink individually, you know, so the farm may accept some losses, then the next stage might, the importer might, the wholesaler might, the bouquet operation might accept some losses. So even if the shrink level is kept at something small, like let's say 1%, 3%, whatever, and, you know, and further down the chain, it does get higher because that's just what happens with perishable product. Actually, what you need to think about is, of those 1 billion stems that were harvested at the start, how many actually make it to the end? And, and not just look at the individual part of the chain, but overall, how many have made it? And I think, you know, if we did a study like that, I think the figure would be staggering. So what this shrink, well, sorry, what this shrink throughout the, the chain does is it really drives this overconsumption of stems. And, you know, if as a team we can work together to solve that, then we're certainly moving in the right direction. And I mean, on top of that, there's a lot of other things that can be done to optimize water usage, optimize packaging, is packaging required? So that, you know, there's really good quick wins to take advantage of, and it can also reduce costs to your business, which leads me on to my next slide. So why should you want to incorporate sustainability in your business? And first and foremost, you know, it's just quite simply the right thing to do. You know, we've all been given, you know, the gift of life on this planet. You know, it's not just our duty as stewards of the planet to take care of it, but it's also our responsibility to make sure everyone has the same access to that quality of life and to allow future generations to have access to that also. So that's, that's first and foremost. But beyond that, moving toward a sustainable focus can be profitable. Uh, one of the big assumptions about being sustainable is it's going to cost a lot of money. You know, all this new green expensive technology, you know, it costs money to get solar panels in, packaging costs double, you know, if you want to go down a compostable or whatever, we all know it, it can be expensive. And the honest answer is, you know, if you're going to make sustainable changes, then the only way it can be classed as sustainable is if it also ticks this economical box. You know, it, it, has to, it all has to do with the three pillars of sustainability I'll talk about in a couple of slides. Um, but really, you can't be a sustainable business if you can't sustain your business. So it's more about doing it right and finding shared value in the projects that you do. So I've highlighted shared value on this slide you see in the top right corner. Um, it's a theory by Michael Porter, and he's got a lot of presentations and talks so all on this. And what it's to do is finding the ability to create value for the planet while also creating value for the business. You know, it's, it's linking profitability and corporate social responsibility. And there's some really good stuff to read on that. So I recommend doing that. So the next reason why you should probably want to incorporate into your business is staff loyalty and recruitment. You know, as the world moves further into this digital age where information is so easily accessed, you find way more people, especially the younger generation, understanding all of these issues more clearly. And, you know, being communicated these issues just far more regularly. So to continue to recruit the high talent that we all want, you know, we, we need to find a focus that helps us, you know, drive some sustainable changes, you know, get on top of these sustainable challenges, because it's going to be required when we're looking for these high talented individuals who understand all of this. And then additionally, at least I can talk for myself, you know, I want to find value in a job or uh, sorry, uh, an employer or, or where I work uh, far beyond, you know, just what I'm paid to do, you know, I, I I, I want to know that my efforts that are they're contributing to something bigger, you know, they're going to move forward to a, a brighter future, you know, they're, they're all contributing to something bigger than, than just myself. And there's some, some level of reward, at least for me, for working for a company like that. 
So that kind of links into that staff loyalty. And then the next reason is to build on your reputation and brand. Uh, this is closely linked to that shared value theory I talked about, but the idea is you're building your image, you know, of who you are and you're doing that by doing the right thing. You know, and if you're doing the right thing, then the idea is you'll receive higher demand for your product or services just because of it. I mean, last year before this, this awful pandemic, I was walking around different floral trade shows in the US, in uh, Germany. And if there was one common subject besides flowers, it's definitely sustainability. Companies are using this to build their brand. And you know, that, that can all provide great benefit to your business. But the underlying thing here is, you know, you've got to make sure you're doing it correctly and it's not just a cover. And then the final point I've gotten here, but there's definitely far more points as to why you'd want to do it, um, is that it's easier just to start now and maintain than trying to catch up in the future. You know, there's just so much development happening in this area. And, you know, you can slowly see things like legislation changing and so on. So there could be a point in the near future where you need to cram a lot of change, a lot of learning, a lot of education into a very short period of time. And it's just far better to start digesting all of this now and develop your own approach. You know, you never know what you could end up doing, the products you could end up working on could be first mover advantages and really benefit your business. And so I guess it all depends on what you choose to do. Okay, so now you're at the stage where you see the bigger picture, you know, hopefully you're motivated and you're ready to achieve, but you need to take some first steps and there still seems to be an awful lot of things to do. So the first thing I would recommend doing is actually look at your team. Who do you have? What backgrounds? What experience do, you, do they have? You know, are they inquisitive by nature? Do they need answers and do they need to get to the bottom of things? Do you have someone who has an active or outright passion for this sort of thing? And then start to bring them all together and really explain that you've got this new focus coming toward a more sustainable path. And what's interesting here is, you know, for me, I, I didn't grow up, you know, with the need to tell my mom to recycle properly. In fact, she was the one telling me. And I, you know, I didn't actively protest climate change and all these different, different things. You know, I, in fact, two years ago, I was very much unaware to a lot of these issues. But really what turned me on to sustainability and made me want to drive change internally and externally, you know, I, I'm talking to you guys now, is I just have this need to figure out the answers to all these questions I can't settle unless I understand it. So one of the misconceptions I'm trying to communicate here is you don't, is don't feel you need to have this stereotypical eco warrior that's driving everything, you know, that they have this huge passion and, you know, like all the activists, activists you see on the television and things. That's, that's really not necessarily what this is all about. You know, no doubt as you go down this process and you learn more and your teams get together and whatever that, you know, you might create some eco warriors and, and that's great, you know, but first, you know, you just need to build your understanding and give it time. Okay. So you've identified a team and, and by the way, this could just be an, an individual person. It really just depends on the business you are, but what you find with bigger businesses is the more people involved, the easier it is to shift that culture, you know, shift the mindset towards a more green focus. Cause that really is what this is all about. You're, you're changing everything that you do in your business, the way you innovate, the way that you recruit and all these different things. It's, it's, it's underlying changing the culture. So you've got more, you know, in a bigger business with more people involved, you've got more people talking about it, learning about it, being inspired, getting excited, and it can really catapult the rate of change and development of the business. So anyway, next I would say look externally and I, I've put on here uh, suppliers. But really, you know, this can be anyone, you know, it could be your customers, you know, what are their goals? Can you align? Do you agree with your customers' goals? Uh, what about competition? Can you learn together? Collaboration is just one of the cornerstones of sustainability. And we can quite simply achieve far more together than we can apart. You know, we all have these pools of resources that we might be able to put towards something like this. And if every company in the industry is going off in all these different directions, then, you know, is that really the most efficient thing that we could be doing as a collective group? but actually focusing those resources and directing them in the same direction could actually make a far greater change and uh, a far quicker change. So I can say from my experience that, um, and then the reason I put suppliers on here is I have actually learned a lot from our suppliers. At, at Floralife, you know, we use a lot of the film for our little flower food packets. And, you know, there's been so much development in packaging over the past few years uh, that it really is hard to catch up. And, and what we found was, you know, our suppliers have really been living and breathing this for far longer than I, I, I could have thought. And, you know, they were very happy to share as much knowledge as they could on the area. So, and, and what you find is this is where your suppliers start to stand out because some know more and some know less. And this really helped us in the beginning. You know, it opened up enough of the, uh, like a, a rabbit hole um, 
and you can really jump in and start finding the answers to all these questions. And it really is like a rabbit hole. So this kind of leads to my, my next point, uh, further education. Uh, there's just so much to read and, and broaden your understanding of sustainability. Um, I'm not sure if I've illustrated well enough up to this point, but there really isn't a golden answer to everything. It all comes back to balancing what we consume, how we consume and, and why we're consuming it. You know, there'll be decisions that contradict some of the other focuses um, and further education can really help you justify your choices. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if you launch something, let's say, for example, you move to paper packaging away from plastic packaging. And there's benefits to paper because it's widely recyclable and all of that. But then there's also negatives because it's carbon footprint and water usage and all of that. So the education really helps you make a justified choice as to why you're doing it and you're balancing everything up. And then you have reasons to explain why you made that choice. So you're not just really jumping on something and then, you know, maybe even regretting it in the future. So a lot of people ask me, you know, what is this extra education? So for besides the Cambridge course, it's been a lot of desk research, a lot of Googling, you know, it, it's kind of exactly what I said before, it's a rabbit hole. You jump into it and it just goes off into all these different tunnels, so many different directions. And, you know, you just have to keep pulling at the threads, you know, keep asking those questions and make sure you get to the bottom of it. So if I give you an example, you know, you might put into Google sustainable packaging and then compostable or recyclable or plastic or whatever pops up. So then you might Google compostable and then EN13432 pops up. That's the standard for composting. And then you Google EN13432 and then the criteria for that pops up. And all you're doing is you're digging and broadening your understanding of every subject. And I mean, I've done this for so many different things now in this sort of sustainable realm that, you know, I felt confident enough to educate people internally and then actually, you know, come together and, and put a presentation for you guys on this sort of thing. So, you know, outside of that, you can find a lot of scientific journals on Google Scholar. Uh, you can look outside the industry at what changes are going on. And, um, you know, you'll typically see mass markets or like supermarkets really driving change. I mean, look at, you know, if you look in European supermarkets, they're, they're really next level. And, you know, look outside the floral industry, attend some great trade shows, um, you know, where people exhibit new technologies and changes. You know, what you'll find is once you've, you've started, it just gets easier and easier to keep digging into it. So the next step with your team is really at this bottom point is to uh, dive into these sustainable development goals. You know, what are applicable to you? You know, what are they trying to achieve? So as you can see here, I took a screenshot from the UN goals, the United Nations website, um, which is a snapshot of the targets trying to be achieved inside of goal number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. And this goal is all about, you know, how we produce, how much we consume, how do we produce, can we be more efficient, is there beneficial end of life to our packaging and, and so on. And, you know, with your team, you might review these and then you might be like, oh, this one here, by 2030, substantially reduce waste generation through pre prevention, reduction, recycling and reuse. And then what you might end up doing is uh, aligning to this target and the key word being here, align. So one issue the world faces uh, with people doing all these different sustainable targets and projects and whatever, is sometimes it can be very hard to capture the benefits because they haven't been designed in a way that matches the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And what I should say at this point is, it's one thing to you know, understand the goals and align your strategy with them, but another to actually officially commit and report on them. I would say the ultimate goal for any business, and I really hope we see that, is to commit on these sustainable development goals, actively report on them. And you know, you can really see some great companies leading the way on this. I, I actively follow a company called Marks and Spencers in the UK with their plan. It is really respectable what they've done. And they've been doing this for years. Okay. So that kind of leads me onto this, this next slide when I talked about Marks and Spencers plan. What we need is a plan. You know, you need to treat this process like a journey. It's important to understand why you're doing what you're doing, but you know, it's just as important to know where you are and where you want to get to and how are you going to get there. So first you've figured out you know, what you want to focus on, you've done this SDG review. And then next you have to really measure where you are. You, know, you can't get somewhere if you have no idea where you're starting. And from that, you, you, know, you want to see some yearly, so maybe you want to set some yearly targets. Uh, you know, so for instance, do you want to reduce your plastic consumption by 10%? Are you going to reduce your shrink by 4%? Are you going to commit to complete carbon footprint assessments uh, on certain products um, you know, and whatever you choose to do. But what you need to do is make sure that they're smart targets, meaning that they're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're realistic, and they're time-based. 
And, you know, don't feel like you need to promise the world either. You know, many small steps in the right direction actually add up to very big things. It's just a simple idea of compounding. It's, it's done in finance all the time. So you may at this point, you know, so we made at this point, you know, now you've got your targets and things. Maybe you need to start thinking, what are these projects we're going to start building up and start taking on that will then drive the achieving of those targets? So what activities need to get done to achieve, you know? Um, it's kind of quite simple. You, you need a plan to help you stick to achieving your targets. So what I haven't mentioned and, and probably should mention is this plan is going to take time to complete. So you can see here it's a timeline. You know, at Floral Life, we decided that to make our plan, our Floral Life 2025 plan, five years. And, you know, it's enough time to continue learning and adapting whilst also allowing projects to uh, flourish and mature and uh, for changes to actually start being measurable. Again, this is a journey. And, uh, you know, it really actually excites me to think about setting our 2030 plan, our 2035 plan and doing all the reviews in between. So the important thing here is, you know, you're making a pro... You're, you're making your progress measurable and relevant. You know, I should, you know, I probably should say at this point that there are some great systems that are, that you can put in place for processes, uh, like so certified to things like ISO 14001. That's for ISO 14001 is all about implementing a solid process internally to drive the measuring and tracking of your plan. It doesn't necessarily tell you what your goal should be, but it really does help with reaching that end goal and communicate clearly and, and driving change. So it's definitely something to consider. Okay, so you have your plan, you know, your targets and you're gonna tackle your projects. You've got a big list of projects that you want to do. I'm sure with some learnings, as you get into them, you're gonna start identifying the correct path. But the next two slides, you know, these are tools that I've used to vet the projects that we've done at Floralife and give me some assurance or some peace of mind that what we're doing is actually moving us in the right direction. So the first is the three pillars of sustainability model. And you've heard me touch on this slightly in the previous slides. Um, so a big part of, you know, being sustainable is the environmental side and the social aspects, you know, you're balancing everything off, but an important fact that I haven't really touched on much or mentioned much is the economical side. So externally, uh, the projects need to bring value to a market, uh, or an economy in some way, you know, people need to be consuming that. And at the end of the day, markets need to continue to expand for investments and growth to continue. But internally, as a business, you really need the project to generate value. You know, it's fairly straightforward. You can't be a sustainable business if you can't sustain your business. I, I've said that before. You have to exist. You have to be profitable. Or at the very least, I guess, break even. So when looking at a project, you need to balance all of these three things off to make your choices. You know, it's, it's no good doing something that has negative impacts on society just because it's good for the planet. And at the same time, it, it can be said for solely focusing on something that's socially sustainable. But what often actually gets missed is focusing on something that is sustainable, both environmentally and social. So you're ticking both those boxes, but then actually not making sense economically. So let's say you have some super fancy solves a lot of the world's uh, problems, technology or packaging. Uh, so I, I keep using packaging, but anyway, it, it increases your cost by 200% and you spend all your time developing, launching, marketing that product. But in the end, only 0.1% of your customer base ends up buying it because it's simply just quite not, it's just simply not affordable. So look at all that time and effort and money that you've put into something by, you know, being sustainable, but then making no change to the world anyway. So, you know, therefore there may have been a middle ground or maybe not even a middle ground that was a better approach. You know, so you might end up selling this middle ground to 10% of your customer base, but it's just far more affordable. And, you know, this is what I was referring to when I mentioned small steps. You know, if you improve your sustainable footprint by 2% every year for 50 years, you're going to be doing far better for the planet than doing a 200% improvement for six months, you know, and then not being in business. And, and I mean, some people might say, well, if you're not in business, that's more sustainable. But at the same time, maybe your competition are going to jump in and then not be sustainable anyway. Okay. So finally, I wanted to bring up the seven sins of greenwashing, and this is the other tool I use. And greenwashing is a popular term used these days for something that is, communi or that is communicated to be more sustainable than really it actually is. So I encourage you to Google the seven sins of greenwashing. Uh, but in short, when you look at what you're doing, can you honestly say you don't fall foul to any of these seven things? So the first is a hidden trade-off to your product or service, meaning, you know, do you focus on one part of the product sustainability, but not that bigger picture? That's kind of what I mentioned about, there's no point in being environmentally um, sustainable, but then not being socially sustainable. Are you looking at that bigger picture of the product? 
The next one is no evidence, or meaning, you know, are you claiming something that could be, um, I don't know, biodegradable? But have you actually done the testing for that? And have you got the testing certificates? You know, this is something that maybe we're closer to the suppliers on. But make sure you ask all of these questions and really understand what it is you're claiming. Do you, I, do you have the proof to back, back up what you're saying? The next one is vagueness. Um, for example, you see a lot of times products being labeled as natural. And I mean, natural sounds great, right? But there's even harmful things that occur naturally. So you have to be specific here. You know, what is the sustainable benefit of that product? What is it actually doing? And I guess a lot of that also links back to the evidence. Okay, so the next one is false labels. So you see a lot of standards on labels these days, product labels, you know, especially for environmentally friendly products. You know, for example, you've got like the fair trade label, you've got the rainforest certificate, and you know, you've got all these other things. And what these labels meaning, really what they are is they're showing all of the work and certification that's gone on in the back end to prove and justify that product's sustainable performance. So a company can't really just make their own labels up and put it on because what that's doing is it's, it's, it's diluting the consumer's understanding and it's encouraging them to think that this product might have been certified in some way just because the design department decided to make something look like a, some sort of sustainable seal or something that, that proves something. Okay, and then the next one we have is irrelevance. Um, an example here would be a product that could be labeled as sustainable, but be, so maybe a product is labeled as sustainable because it doesn't include a certain chemical. But you know, that statement could actually be redundant because the chemical by law could be banned. So you're saying something sustainable because it doesn't have something harmful in, but by law it was never allowed to be in the product anyway, so you shouldn't really be talking about it. And then another sin is the lesser of two evils. And I, I kind of find this one a little funny. The example that gets used a lot online here is organic cigarettes. The point being, okay, great, you have cigarettes and they're organic, whatever that might mean. But the negative impact on the health is just far outweighs the organic benefit of that cigarette. So, you know, it could be perceived that this cigarette's sustainable when really it's actually a lesser of two evils. And then finally, you have false claims. And maybe this is the worst one out of them all. But basically what you're doing here is you're outright lying about the sustainability of your product or your, your service. And I don't really think there's much more to say about that, but if you look at the history of uh, big, large companies, there's a lot falling foul to this and some big news stories. I probably won't mention them, but yeah, it's, it's pretty hectic when you look at what's gone on in the recent past. So, you know, if you can successfully pass the three pillar model I had on the previous slide, or these seven sins of greenwashing, then maybe you could be on a winner for everyone and that could, that could be really great. So to wrap everything up I've said, uh, I think these are the best takeaways. One, if you haven't started, then start now. Uh, look at your internal network, your external network, and who can you collaborate with? You know, I, I can tell you Floral Life would love to, to get involved and then hear your stories, hear your progress and work with you. Um, three, understand where you are and where you want to get to. You know, and number four, ask a lot of questions. Uh, don't settle for a vague and a non-full answer. And then five, finally, don't be afraid of failing. You know, doing something is just far better than doing nothing. So I think that's kind of the end of it. You know, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure pulling this presentation together. I, I actually learned a lot doing it. And again, my name is Mark Allen. Uh, I'm from Floral Life, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out. Uh, I think Cindy might share my email or find me on LinkedIn. I, I don't use that platform enough, but I can definitely start. So yeah, I, I look forward to maybe hearing from you, and thanks again. Well, thank you, Mark, for all this great information. I hope you've learned a, a great deal, as I have. And for all of you listening to this who have prepared presentations and content and giving it, you can appreciate the time that's gone into this and all of the great research. So we thank Mark Smithers Oasis Floral Life for bringing this to us and plus all of the other things they provide along the way. So be sure to follow them as they have webinars, log into the webinars, and you're going to hear about this and many, many other great educational topics. Now with that, if you haven't already, we invite you to join us for the other six educational seminars ranging from logistics, e-commerce, and even a fashion checkup from our PhDs of fashion straight 
from Kent State University. So we're real excited about that. If you haven't listened to those, log into those. They're all new information and things that you haven't learned or seen before. So that's what we want to do, bring you new information and state-of-the-art information. And we hope you'll join us for all seven of the educational seminars. So on behalf of the International Floriculture Expo, this is Cindy Hanauer and today's guest educator, Mark Allen, signing out. And thank you for joining us. Thank you.